Harold, you know, Charlie, he spoke a whole lot about the OMAG's uh, consistency over decades. Uh, is there anything that's been new or innovative that uh, really stands out to you? Well, I think the, the development of the loss control program uh, that you guys are, are now a part of was one of the, one of the first things that, that we did that was very different from uh, what others were doing. Others were just, you know, saying, let's, let's fund the risk. Uh, we looked at it and said, you know, we need to manage those risks. And the best way to do that was to get people who understood how municipalities operated and put them out there helping people. And we used to go, you know, we started going out into the field and doing training programs. Uh, and at one time we were even working with uh, local chambers of commerce to have uh, local businesses come in. We were going out, so what, where were the banks getting their employees trained? Where were the uh, retail merchants getting their employees trained on some subjects like uh, sexual harassment uh, or equal employment opportunity kinds of things? Uh, that was that was really different, uh, and for a municipal organization to be helping to train uh, local governments, that that didn't work out as well as we'd really hoped it would. But uh, today you've got what? How many people do you have, Pam? Six. Six people in the loss control. So that means that the very smallest communities have an opportunity to have the services that used to only Oklahoma City. Tulsa, Enid, or Lawton could, for example, could afford. But now, you guys are able to go out and provide to those municipalities the, the training, or I think you do some grants and so forth, uh, yes. and you know, provide resources that they couldn't have any other way. Harold, we to get me, a, that's a big success. Yeah, we get a lot of questions at OMAG. And because uh, we answer our phones right. and uh, we, we uh, return our calls and we answer our emails. I tell you, uh, we get a lot of questions about uh, a work comp plan, a work comp program. And uh, when I get questions about work comp, I uh, send them along to Pam Spinks. Uh -huh. So I'm going to ask Pam, what is so unique about work comp and work comp plan and the program that you see? Well. I had come from three years of working with a corporate risk manager, so I understood workers' comp. Mr. Pumford gave me the chance to come to work for OMAG and said, I want you to help get this workers' comp plan started. He'd already made a great agreement, uh, wonderful cooperation with the then state insurance fund, so they were going to do the underwriting, but the plan included a loss fund for each individual city. I'd never heard of such a thing. Uh, what what it was the premium would I mean the premium would take care of all the claims and take care of all the of all that processing but each individual city a part of that was a set aside to pay their claims after three years because of the statutory uh, period in the in the comp act then but after three years if they hadn't spent those loss fund dollars on their claims regardless of any other city bam they could get a refund uh, it's very unique. It's been like that for all these years now. The comp plan actually started in 1984 when I first came to work there. And it has, I believe, in the what's, let's see, 84, we started in 77, so what, 32 years now we fed the comp plan, whatever the math is. Uh, I think we've returned close to $50 million 50 to million. our cities and towns. And currently there's 295 Oklahoma cities and towns in that plan. So wow. it was those loss funds that just made it so unique. It was easy to sell sitting at my desk. <laughs> <laughs> well, taking a little bit further, further back, uh, prior to the start of that plan in 1984, uh, in the two times that I had worked with, uh, with the league beginning back in 1972, uh, at that time, government employees were subsidizing the private sector in workers' compensation, the way they did the rates and so forth through the state insurance fund, uh, we were paying more than our losses were. And every time we would figure that out at the municipal league and go over to the state insurance fund and talk with them and say, aha, we, we've caught you and so forth, well, they'd say, okay, well, well, we'll change things. And about nine months later, you'd look at it again. Well, they had come up with another way to still, in our estimation, have us paying more than we should pay. 
We played that cat and mouse game for uh, about 10 or 12 years. And then, uh, I'll, I'll give this accolade, uh, there was a young man named David Goagli, who was the commissioner of the state insurance fund. And uh, he was there when uh, the idea of group self-insurance funding for uh, workers' comp was uh, working its way through the Oklahoma legislature. And uh, in talking with David, uh, he was working with an actuary from back in New Jersey uh, that came up with the idea of this lost fund approach that, that Pam said. So we went from subsidizing the, the private sector to really being able to stand on our, stand on our own. And this program, as Pam said, is, is very unique and it was created by Mr. Glogley. Uh, it, Many, many insurance companies have tried to come in and offer OMAG a better program. And some might be better for one or two members, but nobody's offered anything that would be better for 295 members. And I, I mentioned David from the standpoint that he later on became the president of a small little part-time personnel agency called Express Personnel. <laughs> and he became the, the president of Express Personnel. Everyone thinks about uh, Bob Funk, uh, who's mm -hmm. the chairman of the board, but David Galagli, who created the workers' compensation plan that, that we have, uh, became the president of Express. A very successful young man. Wow. You know, we talked just a little bit about the lost control uh, when you guys started that. Uh, is, was there a, any big challenges or anything when tra you're trying to actually train or orient people who actually came from the private sector to start dealing with these kinds of issues? Well, both in the uh, loss control and in the, the claim side, or at least from my mm -hmm. experience. On, on loss control, uh, at, the educa at the formal educational level, people that study this in college and so forth, uh, primarily what they're taught are the regulations that the Occupational Safety and Health Administration have, mm -hmm. and go out and enforce those kinds of, kinds of things. Well, those have very little to do with the actual losses of municipalities. True. They're written for warehouses, for uh, retail establishments, for manufacturing establishments. So you have to, you had to reorient anyone. I remember the first young man that we hired to do loss control, and I could tell after about uh, a month that he just, he didn't understand. And so we sent him to Piedmont. Uh, talked to the city manager at Piedmont, and we sent him out there to work with them for a, for a month, where he learned that there was one person who was reading the meters, uh, who was putting up stop signs or street signs, uh, who was also doing some of the inspections and so forth. And he thought there were probably you know one person doing each of those jobs to kind of reorient. And then on a claim side, uh, in the private sector. They put a lot of emphasis on how fast you close a file. You're working for the insurance company, you're trying to produce a profit for the insurance company, so making the financial settlement quickly was the primary issue. And for us, it was a matter of were we negligent in what we did? Uh, and then how do you go about settling the value? And, and for example, early on, the maximum recovery from a governmental entity in Oklahoma for loss of life was $100,000 per person. So what do you pay for a paraplegic? Uh, and these are people that have been used to talking about paying four and five million dollars for uh, a fatality. So getting them to understand that we weren't going to be judging them on how rapidly they closed a file. But what were we doing to protect our immunities, to protect the exemptions we had going forward? What kind of precedent would we set if we paid a claim? If we were wrong, we wanted to pay. But if we weren't wrong, we were going to, we were going to spend the money. A, a quick example of that. I was a little concerned about how much money we were spending defending things. Yep, right. And so we had a study done and uh, they, they came in and they said, well, you don't do a very good job in managing claims. And we said, well, why? And they said, well, because you spend three times as much money defending a claim as you do in paying out losses. And that's reverse of the way it should be. You should be paying out $3 and spending $1 in, in uh, defense. And I said, well, 
how much are we spending compared to what other people spend that do that? And they said, oh, about a third. And I said, okay, we'll, we'll stay with what we're doing. We think that's Doesn't sound too, right bad, too bad to me. Right, well, we thought it worked out. 